Okay, then I think we should start, uh, though uh, it seems like uh, some people are still joining in uh, in the coming minutes. It's um, hello and good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you here in our uh, EU Ukrainian uh, virtual roundtable on energy transition on. Ukraine's new NDC, a start for an ambitious Green Deal agenda. Um, let me welcome you on behalf of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, my name is Robert Sperfeld. I am the program officer for East and Southeast Europe in the Böll Foundation's head office in Berlin. Um, but we are hosting this discussion format jointly between the head office and our Kiev Regional Office um, of the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Um, glad to have you here. Um, let me start with uh, three short technical remarks. The first is about the working language uh, that is English in our discussion, but we offer simultaneous translation into Ukrainian language. Uh, for listening Ukrainian, you should choose uh, the German uh, channel uh, below in the uh, on the bottom line of your uh, Zoom window. You will find a globe where you can choose the language channel, and you should choose German for listening Ukrainian. I'm sorry for this inconvenience. Uh, this is for technical reasons. Um, uh, second technical remark is that we are recording this um, event, so be aware of it when you uh, are joining into the discussion later with question, just be aware of it. Um, on the procedure, uh, we will first um, talk between the panelists and then later on, after maybe 45 or 50 minutes, we will open the floor for more uh, questions and answers then from the audience. Yeah, okay, so uh, without further technical issues, let's um, talk about our topic, or today's topic. Um, the International Climate Conference in Glasgow will start in about two weeks. Ahead of this, uh, the government of Ukraine has approved an updated pledge to, the, to reduce the carbon emissions until 2030. Uh, with this uh, so-called nationally determined contribution, NDC, as you have seen it in the uh, title of our event, uh, Ukraine has proven a constructive approach to the international climate negotiations process in the framework of the Paris Agreement for limiting global warming. Uh, the new target, the new Ukrainian target, shows a significant increase in, in ambition compared to the previous one. Um, in our particular EU-Ukrainian format today, we uh, want to approach this topic mainly from the angle of the interlinkages of uh, Ukraine's decarbonization policies uh, with the economic and political relations to the European Union. Um, the European Union has declared the European Green Deal as its major vehicle and, and uh, guiding concept to drive the path to decarbonization and climate neutrality. And uh, European Union has declared that this transition uh, must be a joint effort with uh, the neighborhood, with the European neighborhood, in particular the Eastern neighborhood. Um, however, as uh, we think in the Heinrich Böll Foundation, much is still to be done to develop uh, this external dimension of the European Green Deal. That's why we want to open the space uh, for discussing the role to play for the EU-Ukrainian cooperation uh, on energy transition and Green Deal and, and uh, climate protection, um, the cooperation on, to speed up the transition and to complement Ukraine's decarbonization path that is outlined in the new uh, NDC. Um, I'm very glad that we can have um, four distinguished speakers with us here for this discussion. I will uh, briefly introduce our speakers. 
uh, in the order of their initial statements. Um, uh, first, I'm very glad that Irina Stavchuk is with us, Deputy Minister of Energy and Environmental Protection in Ukraine, of Ukraine. Um, she has um, two degrees from the Kiev Polytechnic Institute and the Swedish International Institute for Industrial mm -hmm. Environmental Economics on Environmental Policy and Ecologic Man Management. Uh, be before she entered um, the government as deputy minister, she has been working in different functions for environmental civil society organizations in Ukraine and with pan-European networks. Um, second, uh, uh, we will have uh, Markus Lippold. Uh, welcome, Markus. Uh, he is team leader at the EU Commission's support group for Ukraine, team leader for energy, climate, environment, and Green Deal aspects of the uh, EU cooperation with Ukraine. Uh, he has been working in different functions for the European Commission before um, on international energy relations um, and also working in, uh, in, in uh, private sector um, positions uh, with relation to the energy sector. He is a member of Chatham House and several advisory boards and co-author of energy policies of international energy agency countries, country reviews for Greece and the UK. Um, third, we have um, Anna Ackermann. Um, welcome, Anna. Uh, Anna holds um, master's degrees in power engineering and environmental sciences, environmental policy and management. Um, Anna managed the energy policy reform expert group of Ukraine's uh, largest civil society platform, reanimation package of reforms. And uh, she is one of the co-founding members of Ukraine's key environmental NGO center, uh, 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 Center for Environmental Initiatives, EcoAction. And last not least, um, uh, we have Ruven Stubbe, uh, working for Berlin Economics as an analyst in the project Low Carbon Ukraine, um, just recently co-authoring a paper on, uh, carbon, on, on climate diplomacy from EU side towards the uh, associated Eastern Partnership countries, Ukraine, Moldova, and Georgia. And uh, yeah, he has been working for other think tanks uh, on uh, uh, on energy issues and um, economic issues um, before. Yes, so um, that's it for the introductions. Um, without further ado, now I uh, would like to ask Irina um, to present first um, the, the new NDC. Um, the, how did you um, establish this? NDC and uh, what are the, the critical factors for its uh, implementation um, and what can be said about the role of the cooperation with the European Union and the for achieving this um, uh, uh, goals of these targets of emission reduction um, outlined in the NDC. Irina, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Robert, and greetings to all the participants. Uh, first of all, let me thank you for organization of this event. Uh, and of course, we are ready to share the, the Ukrainian NDC, the challenges and the whole process. I will try to squeeze the, the, the full information that was happening over the last two years into uh, seven, ten minutes. So first of all, I would like to put everybody a little bit into, in, into the context of Ukraine. Um, the greenhouse gas emissions uh, decreased substantially in the 90s after the collapse of the Soviet Union, together with uh, a lot of industrial production, which started to gain in the end 90s. And from this uh, slide, you can see that from somehow in 1998 till 2008, the GDP was uh, growing very fast. At the same time, the greenhouse gas emissions due to the introduction of different measures on energy efficiency and modernization were not growing 
um, at the same time. So we had a decoupling at that period, which could be clearly seen. But then after the first financial crisis, the economy tried to regain then again the situation in the East and the war and uh, all the economic consequences also again put down the economy and emissions together with it. So if we look at the last 10 years, then we can clearly see the fluctuations of both GDP and greenhouse gas emissions following each other. And the task that we have on the governmental level and the idea which is put in the NDC is that we want to develop, we want to have um, quite a high uh, annual GDP growth uh, from 4% and in the uh, newly approved economic strategy by 2030, it's up to 7% per year, but at the same time, uh, introduction of decarbonization measures, which would keep the emissions um, out of the business as usual trajectory. Um, we have certain gains in the development of renewable energy sector. As I said, in terms of GDP, we are quite uh, behind many countries in Central Europe and also if you look at the regional and overall kind of world perspective. So also we are in Annex 1 as economy in transition. In terms of GDP, we are not at that level. And uh, also the energy poverty issues are very strong in Ukraine. And um, in 2019, 65% of the people applied for the state subsidies. And uh, now with the prices on gas, the situation is getting even worse. Um, so yes, this is the car, like the trajectory with greenhouse gas emissions and the way we see it. So basically in NDC, we approve the target to reduce emissions by 65%, which is certain reduction from the current levels, but is also, um, but it's, uh, substantial change from the projected business as usual in 2030. And we also have a vision to get climate neutrality not later than in 2060. Uh, and it's also in the strategy of economy of Ukraine and in the NDC. The discussion of the target and the numbers was based on the results of the modeling of several scenarios which followed a very heavy consultation process with many, many actors. We had over, I think, 100 meetings with ministries, with experts, with business associations, with specific businesses to actually uh, understand what has been modeled, uh, how to implement it, how relevant it is, how possible it is, how much it would put cost to check all the assumptions which were put in the model in the practice and basically 35% was a um, compromise uh, on the governmental level uh, as a result of uh, very substantial discussions. As a positive side of these discussions is that actually the, the discussion and approval of the target really uh, was high on the agenda of many ministers and prime minister and uh, by businesses. So really in Ukraine, the understanding of the issue, the actions which have to be done on the climate uh, policies have increased substantially. Um, we also, through the NDC process, calculated the necessary investments on the macroeconomic level for different sectors. And by 2030, it's uh, on the level of 100 billion euros. Uh, the amount of money is quite high because if we look at our kind of capital costs in the previous years, uh, its annual rate is on the level of 20 billion euros. So having half of it for decarbonization is also is, is quite a challenge. Um, certain measures out of it, of course, make economic sense and have to happen anyway. And uh, the government understands this and will work on it. But still, the challenge to get the resources to organize the system that actually the necessary transformations are implemented requires uh, quite huge efforts on coordination of policies, economic instruments, and uh, financial strategies and instruments. 
Uh, the NDC of Ukraine covers all the sectors. And uh, after its approval in July, we started to work very actively on its practical implementation. So similar to what EU has in its uh, Fit for 55 package, we started to work on and, and already identified key transformations which have to happen in every sector. And these transformations are already agreed with the ministries. And on these key transformations, the ministries are now working on development of the kind of assessments and providing information on the costs, on the barriers, on the existing regulative uh, situation, on the existing strategies and planned strategies, and on concrete action plans, which have to be part of the governmental action plan on its implementation. Um, this process is not easy because uh, in certain transformations we just don't have information and it's kind of um, gaining by doing process that we dive into the really looking uh, deeper into each transformation and what has to happen and through this process develop the necessary actions but also need on analysis on uh, assessments on investment calculation needs um, and so on um, we are also so we are working on three tracks now the first one is development of this action plan and also identifying which activities are already in the governmental plans and which have, have to be developed further which have to be prioritized higher uh, based on the um, uh, ndc and the green agenda the second track is to work on environmental finance reform and also overall financial strategy for ndc implementation uh, and the last one is overall climate uh, governance architecture, how the government, uh, not government, but in general Ukraine uh, will implement and um, make sure that uh, it's on track with its uh, current and future uh, climate goals. And for that, we are in the process of development of the framework law, which should put all the necessary elements uh, on the example, good examples of uh, other countries which have already framework law on climate uh, policy. Um, yeah, so this is what I just said. Um, we are also working on monitoring reporting verification as a first step to introduce emission trading system. And it's also part of the kind of overall implementation system in Ukraine, which is planned for the future. And uh, on finance, there are many, many issues and uh, many areas of work. We are happy to have uh, and uh, coordinate with EU. Uh, I forgot to say that uh, on the very high political level, Ukraine uh, kind of joined uh, EU Green Deal in terms of promising to align its policies with European Green Deal policies. And we have set up a regular dialogue uh, to discuss uh, cooperation and uh, kind of uh, implementation with uh, European partners. And at the recent meeting, there was set up um, a finance platform uh, to discuss and coordinate uh, financial issues on NDC implementation. Um, we are also looking at green bonds, we are looking at EU taxonomy, we are looking at uh, carbon pricing and uh, analytical base for its uh, reform. And uh, yeah, in this, we are happy to cooperate with Berlin Economics as they uh, help us to uh, develop necessary analytical uh, assessments. Um, and also we started to work on development of Ukrainian climate fund as one of the important elements uh, for the areas where there is um, better financing with idea that Ukrainian uh, carbon tax and environmental taxes which are paid now on the national level should be directed into the fund for support of transformations where the government support is needed. Um, and it should be on the example of the governance structure which exists uh, with the energy efficiency fund. So supervisory board, certain programs, clear criteria uh, to make sure that the carbon and environmental taxes which are collected in Ukraine 
uh, then reinvested and support much quicker transformations in the sectors. Um, that's it from my side. Unfortunately, I have I can be only till the six o'clock today because I have to join another meeting. So if there would be questions to me uh, uh, for the discussion, it, it would be better to have it before. I'm very sorry for that. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Irina, uh, for this uh, comprehensive overview. And um, yeah, so we will then collect questions to you first, but still first, uh, we will uh, give the floor to the other um, experts. Um, and uh, I would like to ask first um, Markus Lippold now um, to uh, give us a br brief overview from EU side on the uh, cooperation uh, with, with Ukraine on uh, Green Deal and um, which formats do exist and what uh, can we expect of how it will be developed um, in the coming months and years to uh, to create a coherent framework for um, uh, Green Deal cooperation. Um, so what, what can the external dimension of the European Green Deal offer here? And um, yeah, thank you for, for your perspective. Yes, Robert, thank you very much. Uh, uh, also for the opportunity to speak here. Uh, welcome, everyone. A special welcome to Irina. Um, nice to see you at least on a Zoom <laughs> call, if not uh, in person. Um, Arena already outlined a lot in terms of uh, what the Commission is uh, actually doing in terms of cooperation uh, with Ukraine in terms of the Green Deal. Um, the Green Deal, as you know, when it was announced uh, in 2019, uh, it wasn't new as such. It relies on uh, many sort of legislative uh, uh, pieces that already exist within the Commission. It was uh, it was becoming, although um, a, a matter of sort of focusing in on uh, reaching climate neutrality by 2050 um, more, and uh, also putting in the 2030 midterm goals in terms of uh, really achieving climate uh, neutrality. Um, uh, that was the reason for the Commission Vice President uh, Timmermans, actually, together with the uh, Prime Minister of uh, Ukraine, Mr. Shmihal, to come up with the idea of a focused uh, dialogue, meaning all the sectoral discussions um, and uh, corporations that exist with the uh, different DGs in the Commission, you said, need to be, uh, if you will, streamlined a bit more, really getting the um, highest attention possible in terms of uh, moving forward uh, with Ukraine on the uh, climate ambitions. And a group which has been, which is now called the sort of Green Deal Focused Dialogue has been uh, established, which is led by the Deputy uh, Prime Minister, uh, Ms. Olga Stefanishina on Ukraine side, and the head of the support group uh, of Ukraine, Ms. Um, Matanova, who's also the um, Deputy Director General for DGNIA. Within this focused dialogue, we've just had the second meeting um, last month, as uh, Rina highlighted. What we've covered in that focused dialogue uh, are topics like coal regions in transition, energy efficiency, uh, industrial alliances, and how Ukraine industry can join um, the sort of EU uh, association that already exists, renewable energy in general, um, research and development, and then participation uh, of Ukraine in, uh, for example, the Horizon programs. Then we look at transport, um, climate uh, architecture that uh, Rina also already highlighted, and uh, environment. We've also been involved with sort of the NDC or the updated NDC and the current ambition levels that uh, Ukraine has uh, officially submitted. 
We think there's more that can be done, but at least uh, the target, minus 65%, um, is, is very encouraging. We are now focusing on, together with Ukraine, actually getting that NDC implemented. Uh, Irina already said that uh, there is a sort of implementation action plan which is being uh, currently worked on, which should be ready by the first quarter of the next year. And in the latest focus dialogue we had um, in Kiev, where Irina was also um, present, we started launching a financing platform uh, together with uh, the international financial organizations and donors, which is quite uh, quite important. So in order to really get it on the ground, we look at reform and legislation, uh, meaning regarding environment especially, there are four laws which are currently stuck uh, in, uh, in Parliament, which the Environment Commissioner of the EU on his recent visit to Ukraine has also highlighted as um, that being a necessary step, uh, enabling step um, to get the uh, climate ambitions uh, really moving forward. So we're talking about uh, legislation on waste management, on industrial emissions, uh, environmental control, and the Emerald Network, which is the uh, biodiversity aspect. We're also focusing on uh, waste and circular economy, on the forestry, and all the items which basically get us to the uh, next uh, COP um, discussions. And uh, that means we are really looking at uh, sort of the detailed legislation, working towards getting that passed uh, in the parliament. Uh, Rina and her team are very much um, onto that. Um, and we've at the same time um, outlined the sort of circular economy plan of the EU, um, that is the uh, new circular economy action plan and the new EU forest strategy for 2030, as uh, also Ukraine is looking currently at forestry sector uh, reform and uh, and biodiversity. So there is a a uh, a whole range of topics where we are. Uh, already engaging uh, with Ukraine and the uh, respective teams and uh, on environment that is uh, uh, Irina and her team, but also transport um, is um, uh, a very important uh, topic and uh, especially transport emissions uh, were one of the sort of key items why we had the discussion in the first place in terms of which reduction levels we can actually see in uh, Ukraine's NDC. So I think I'll stop. I'll stop there. Um, the point to take away, I think, is uh, we are engaging already with Ukraine on this on on the Green Deal and uh, especially on uh, uh, sector items. Um, environment being one of them. We are currently at three meetings of the focus dialogue groups a year. So the next meeting will uh, now likely be in January. And uh, we'll be picking up uh, sort of topics as they move forward and um, where, uh, like on the Energy Efficiency Fund and its governance, which is a sort of um, key fund for us in the way it is uh, organized in terms of governance. Um, those reform elements uh, are a sort of staple diet of that dialogue, and we're moving forward on those items together. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Markus Lippold, for for this um, overview from from your side, complementing the the um, uh, present Irina's presentation. Um, uh, so, but be, before asking questions back to you, I will first, uh, I would like to give the floor to Anna Ackermann of um, the uh, environmental NGO EcoAction um, to, to share with us uh, your perspective from the environmentalist per perspective. Um, uh, 
so on on the uh, international platforms like Carbon uh, uh, Climate Action Tracker, uh, these um, NDC goals, um, both of, of the European Union and uh, Ukraine are considered to be, to, to be insufficient. Um, but uh, from the presentations we just heard, uh, we learned that it's a lot of nitty gritty uh, work to be done. Uh, on, on uh, many parallel tracks and it needs a lot of co coordination. So what's, what's your uh, assessment um, and what are the critical factors from, from your side to um, uh, uh, successfully implement uh, the, the decarbonization path of, of Ukraine? Um, yeah, and, and maybe you can also say a few words about um, the resonance of the uh, decarbonization policies and the uh, climate change issue in the uh, society in, in, in general, uh, if there is uh, public support or uh, 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 how the communication of, um, of these uh, uh, reforms, of the decarbonization reforms is, uh, is managed if, if there is a public support uh, for this at all. Uh, thank you, Anna, for, for your take. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, dear participants, dear colleagues, um, I'm, I'm honored to be talking to you today, representing the voice of Ukraine civil society in regard of uh, Ukraine's climate policies and the new climate goal. Um, well, back at home, uh, we are used to be talking about whichever issue in very particular terms, whatever decision is taken by the national authorities, it has to be named either a victory or a betrayal. Uh, we love to use that word. Um, but uh, of course, in reality, um, everything is much more complicated than that. Uh, that's why I would like to kind of briefly outline uh, to you the strong and weak points of Ukraine's uh, new NDC to the Paris Agreement. Mm, and my goal is to show um, the progress that happened and what could be still improved, uh, hopefully with the support of our European partners and through uh, stronger future cooperation between Ukraine and the EU, uh, which um, already played an important role in shaping U Ukraine's climate discourse uh, on the highest political level. And uh, Irina already mentioned that. Um, so if we compare Ukraine's um, new NDC to the previous goal we had, it is indeed an impressive change into a positive direction. Uh, if previously Ukraine was largely playing with numbers and promising to uh, in fact, increases greenhouse gas emissions uh, instead of decreasing them. And everything is due to this, uh, the baseline year in 1990. Um, the new climate goal is uh, clear. It's, uh, it basically says that Ukraine would stabilize or somewhat decrease the emissions in the coming decade. Um, civil society and international partners, uh, energy community and EU commission uh, supported this new goal. Um, and I would say even more that uh, without, to, in my opinion, without the EU's Green Deal and without the uh, Carbon Neutral Europe pledge by the EU, I really doubt that Ukraine's new NDC had been the same. Um, so the mere way that the EU has been shaping its climate policies already had an impact on the Ukrainian agenda. Uh, and just think about this, that in the times of uh, COVID-19, while still trying to address all the consequences of the pandemic, the Ministry of Environment managed to convince the government and submit to UNFCCC a much more ambitious climate target. That covers also all the sectors of the economy. Um, so let me mention now uh, what is on the other side of the medal, uh, maybe in three, three dimensions, global, national, and more local, what concerns the population. Um, so um, we, should, uh, we should remember that the goal is to, uh, to keep global warming at a relatively, relatively safe level. Um, Ukraine's NDC is unfortunately still not ambitious enough to keep the global warming at 1.5 degrees uh, Celsius that is defined by the Paris Agreement. Um, and analysis by a carbon action tracker that Robert, you mentioned uh, just before, shows that Ukraine's fair share should be cutting emissions by more than one third from today's level by, uh, by 2030. Um, I may even, uh, if you don't mind, I can share quickly the screen just to show you how it looks like. Um, and um, maybe it will give you an idea. Um, there you go. So um, 
so yeah, um, the climate action tracker shows that Ukraine's share should be uh, much, much better. And and uh, the NDC is called in the new climate goal even is called critically insufficient. Um, altogether, uh, global emissions, uh, as defined by IPCC, should be 45% lower uh, in 2013 in comparison to 2010. Uh, and this is also relevant to Ukraine, um, as well as for, of course, many other countries uh, that are also not still, did not pledge uh, a goal that would actually help. So what would actually be, uh, why would this be fair um, in regard of also Ukraine? Uh, in another recently published analysis by Carbon Brief, and I think that took many people by surprise uh, when we shared that, Ukraine appears to be number 11 in this list uh, of the countries who cont contributed most to climate change through CO2 emissions that accumulated historically in the atmosphere. So you can see Ukraine between Canada and France uh, on this graph. Um, of course, um, Ukraine's national circumstances do play a major role here um, in what Ukraine could realistically uh, achieve. Um, so um, yeah, um, on, on these terms, uh, it's of course different. So there is kind of practice, practice and reality that goes into play. Um, many uh, were already of them mentioned and also there is a lack of financing probably and, and of course the war and economic situation and so on. Uh, unlike in the EU, climate policy is not yet an overarching one uh, for Ukrainian decision makers in society. Um, the 2060 net zero target, for example, is mentioned briefly and kind of modestly in the national economic strategy that was adopted recently, uh, but there is no understanding of the pathway toward net zero. Uh, there is no concrete plans for now of how the energy transition transformation of the economy should happen, and uh, of course uh, the ministries are working on this now, but at the moment there is kind of no clarity. There is no call phase out date. Um, or defined role of different energy sources in mid term and long term, uh, such as natural gas, such as hydrogen, that everybody is talking about at the moment, but uh, we actually don't know how it actually fits into energy transition and what kind of energy transition, we don't even know. Uh, the NDC itself also leaves uh, some sectors largely free, I would say, from the need to decarbonize in the nearest future. And uh, the main accent in the NDC is on energy sector transformation, both supply and demand uh, that are expected to deliver 20 to 25 percent of emissions reduction from the current level. Uh, but uh, agriculture industry, transport, they can, kind of, uh, especially agriculture industry, they are largely stay untouched uh, and are allowed to even somewhat increase the emissions. Uh, in this way, there is a possibility to keep the status quo. Um, and finally, uh, I would like to sum up with this, um, the kind of the local level, the local perspective, the population. Um, the pop Ukrainian population is concerned about other environmental issues, much more than climate change. Uh, and according to recent surveys, almost half of all Ukrainians say they worry about climate change in the world. They do worry. Um, but uh, only 17% are concerned about how climate change would affect their community. And probably that number is even looks too big. And in reality, uh, issues like water pollution, air pollution, illegal forest logging, poor waste managing, management. Uh, these are the top issues that worry people the most. Um, interestingly enough, many of, uh, of them, of these issues are in one way or another connected to climate. Uh, just like energy efficiency is an effective kind of climate policy tool is closely connected to improving people's welfare, decreasing emissions. Um, but uh, this demand for climate action rem remains much, much lower than the, in the EU. Uh, and that transforms, of course, into the lack of need to respond by authorities on different levels. Uh, even though many NGOs around the country, including EcoAction, uh, constantly work on improving general awareness of the population about climate change. Uh, but and there is a bit but. Uh, to, to end with, uh, if we wait for the demand uh, for action to come from the bottom, climate action may be delayed for uh, a couple more decades. Um, while the time to act, of course, is now, uh, I believe that uh, the main tool uh, here is a strong international cooperation, making common steps toward climate neutral European continent by 2050. Uh, well, and I hope uh, we'll discuss more today about how this could be achieved.
Yeah, uh, thank you, Anna, for putting this in, in this context from, from an environmentalist perspective. Um, coming now to Ruven, um, looking at, uh, at it from an economic point of view. Um, uh, so we, we heard a lot already about the, the needs for, for investments. Um, Irina was, was talking about this and, and also Marcos. Um, investments for, for managing this, um, uh, these emission reduction targets. And um, so uh, this is uh, then, then a question to, to you, um, Oven. Um, would, would you say that the EU uh, can offer uh, help with that and uh, is, is about to um, develop schemes that, that could be helpful for, for this uh, challenge that is one of the major challenges? And uh, second, um, uh, question then then to you um, uh, um, do do we have the the right priorities from an economic point of view on uh, in in the cooperation formats um, um, between EU and and Ukraine um, with with regard to um, for example the the coal sector as uh, one major source of of carbon emissions um, uh, yeah. So, what's what's your your take on uh, and your perspective on on this um, uh, outlook on the outlook for achieving the carbon um, emission reduction targets? Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thanks for for having me. It's a pleasure. Um, first of all, I I applaud uh, Ms. Stavchuk uh, once again and her team uh, for the tireless efforts to get the updated NDC across the line. I think the updated NDC is a big milestone, um, as uh, the, the other speakers have mentioned before. It is the first real emission reduction target of Ukraine, and it is a large step in the right direction. However, uh, there is no, we don't have time to rest as the largest part of the work is still to come, which is the implementation, um, which is starting now. So to develop strategies and ultimately concrete measures to achieve the reduction target. And um, so you ask about the, uh, to give an economic perspective on the NDC and uh, specifically about the investments. This was the first question. Um, so uh, when you ask me uh, as an economist, obviously I have to, I cannot emphasize enough that the centerpiece of any effective and efficient climate policy mix should be an adequate uh, carbon price on emissions. And um, its purpose is not to generate additional tax revenues. In fact, uh, revenues can, and I think also should be channeled back to, to households and, uh, and companies, but to generate an incentive uh, throughout the entire economy against carbon emissions. And um, obviously it's not a golden bullet that solves all the problems. Uh, we still need a lot of improvements on, on regulation. We have to think about financing some measures, uh, financing some investments that uh, will not come forth with the incentive of the carbon price alone. But without the carbon price, uh, it will be much more difficult to kind of coordinate all the different uh, investments that have to happen within an economy. And um, I think, so uh, Irina actually mentioned already the, the, or showed like this table, with uh, the overall estimates of, of uh, investments. So for the entire Ukrainian economy, we estimate uh, together with the Institute for Economics and Forecasting at the Ukrainian National Academy of Sciences, that roughly 100 billion euros of NDC relevant investments need to be put forward uh, till 2030 to achieve the NDC. Um, however, about 60 billion euros of this would, would happen anyway. So. They might not happen in the exact same projects. So a carbon price would make sure or help to make sure that these 60 billions that would happen anyway um, are spent, uh, invested in the right kind of low carbon projects. So just as an example, more renewables instead of uh, building new coal power plants in the electricity sector. But then on top, we have the other 50, uh, 40 billion euros or so 
of investments, uh, so around 4 billion annually, that need to, mobilized, uh, need to be mobilized additionally. And um, a carbon price can help somewhat stimulate additional investments by making low carbon alternatives to existing carbon intensive uh, production ways competitive. And it should be the centerpiece. But as we see it, uh, it should be flanked by two blocks of other measures. And I think the first block is uh, what you could summarize as sort of improving regulation and improving the functioning of, of markets that already exist, uh, especially the different markets for electricity. And um, some markets are, re are badly regulated uh, at the moment. There, there might be uh, price caps, there might be public companies or large private companies that, that capture the market. Um, and also, um, so there, there needs to be regulation that needs to be developed to, to address these issues. And uh, improving regulation also helps to increase the regulatory certainty for investors to be able to recover their investments in low, low carbon projects so that they actually uh, will be motivated to, to do these investments. This means, for example, settling outstanding debt to energy suppliers, prevent future accumulation of arrears, improve enforcement of penalties, regulatory oversight. So lots and lots of nitty gritty issues. Um, it also means phasing out regulated energy tariffs and price caps uh, so that uh, electricity generators can recover investments uh, and also that price signals are passed on to consumers. And I know this, uh, this would put uh, an additional burden on low, low income households, especially if you phase out the, the regulated electricity tariffs. Uh, however, I think there are appropriate tools uh, for redistribution of, of income to address this. And uh, for example, a reformed household and utility scheme and that's better targeted at low-income households, and these should be the tools to to address these uh, these questions of uh, energy poverty, of inequality, and not a dysfunctional energy price uh, regulation. Uh, I don't think that that can be the answer because it's standing in the way of of decarbonization, for example, in in the electricity sector. So this is kind of the first block uh, next to carbon pricing, better regulation. And then the second block is targeted investment support for low carbon investments. <clears throat> so these 4 billion euros annually of additional investments uh, that, are, that obviously requires a lot of resources. And by far, the largest part of the investments uh, need to come from the private sector. However, uh, all over the world, but particularly in, in Ukraine, we have imperfect capital markets. So there's limited access to credit for companies. Even if you have a carbon price uh, and you, you know as a company uh, investing in, in some new way of production uh, will be profitable. Uh, you might not have the credit to, to invest in this. There are short repayment periods. Usually we have uh, these projects uh, for decarbonization have really long time horizons. So it repays only after 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and if you have to pay back your, your loan after five years, uh, it's, it's impossible to, uh, to do this investment. So this justifies an active role of uh, the state to support private investments where needed. And I think uh, the ideal form of that for that would be a national climate fund. Irina has already mentioned um, the plan of, of the ministry to, to put forward such a fund. So I think that's, um, that's a really good development. <clears throat> and obviously this fund needs to have proper governance. So we have to think about all these uh, institutional issues uh, when setting up a fund, the required size and the focus of the fund need some need a lot of additional ass assessment, and we we need proper targeting of uh, of these uh, investment projects for projects that are profitable with an adequate carbon price but infeasible due to the credit constraints without support from the fund. So I I see the role to come to your second question of uh, the EU and also. The partner countries of Ukraine in general, including Germany, would be to support the Ukraine in, in all these three areas or policy blocks. So not only co-financing, for example, the National Climate Fund, but also land political and analytical support for, uh, for carbon pricing and for, for regulatory reform. And this uh, potentially this could uh, be through 
clear uh, ex ante conditions, conditionalities, if you want, for the financial support of, of, of the climate fund. So, for example, through twinning or matching car uh, carbon pricing revenues in Ukraine that are channeled in the National Climate Fund with uh, European money, um, so that this would, on the one hand, strengthen the political incentive for a, a higher carbon price, um, and it would be a clear conditionality that can be kind of agreed on uh, ex ante before before setting up uh, this this potential European contribution to to the climate fund. Uh, another kind of uh, area where I see uh, some some problems that that should be addressed is uh, there should uh, be support for renewable projects only if the the current uh, payment arrears in the old uh, feed-in tariff system is cleared up and there's a credible plan to, to avoid future, uh, future issues in this area. So these are kind of topics where, where you can make clear ex ante conditionalities, um, agree um, on these conditions beforehand, and then there can be a support, uh, financial support for, for such a climate fund. So obviously this would need a high level political commitment uh, within on the European side which which needs to be discussed uh, within the EU between the member states. But I think uh, this kind of briefly outlines um, the way I see uh, how the EU and its member states could support Ukraine and, and decarbonization. Okay, many thanks, uh, Ruven, for, for this perspective. Um, yeah, and as um, Irina announced that she have to, has to, to leave um, a bit earlier, then uh, I think I should open now the floor for, uh, for questions to her. So please use the raise hand function in, in Zoom um, to, uh, uh, to ask questions. Um, you, you find the uh, uh, raise hand button in, um, in the Zoom window under reactions. And uh, you would have now the opportunity to, um, to ask a question. Um, but uh, uh, I, I guess, Irina, perhaps you anyway have some uh, answers or, or comments to, to what you have heard from the other speakers. Um, so you would have the opportunity to, to answer on, on, um, on, on this now. Um, these um, ideas for um, support for the financing uh, question that uh, Ruven just um, introduced, would this be a, um, a working way from your perspective? I mean, we are we started to discuss the finance issues from the first meetings we had on NDC target and implementation when we were discussing with different sectors. And uh, this area was identified as one of the very important one, but also a very complex one because it touches uh, so many different issues from the side of generating the taxes and like the, the scope, the, the level of the environmental taxation and carbon taxes in Ukraine uh, to, the, to the collection and then to the how we use these funds. And of course, if we talk about reform of this area, it has to be a complex solution with a very good vision how it will develop for the future so that everybody understands where it goes. Um, and uh, when, when we start looking at carbon pricing more precisely, and now in the parliament we have the law which raises the carbon tax, um, the Minister of Finance suggested to raise it by three times from 10 grivnas till 30 grivnas, it's still one euro, which we consider as a like, very small amount. But when we started to look at like what should be the carbon price in Ukraine, which is fair and which is um, uh, and which will uh, stimulate the emission reductions, then th then comes like two issues. One is that there are no really analytical studies which provide this range. So like not specific like so with the berlin economics we calculated the impacts of 150 grivnas tax 
But if you talk about the political decision, we should understand the range of the potential increase and how it will impact the economy. Um, the, 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 the area of heating and electricity is uh, so much dependent on the reforms in the energy efficiency for households and how people are ready to get together to take loans for energy efficiency measures. And then even the, the current tariffs don't cover the full price. So it all puts it's very problematic just to put the carbon price because they don't pay the full price anyway now. So how would it help to actually bring the changes? That's about this sector. Then we have um, a big industry sector, which puts the question back, but this money now go to the budget. What does it mean? And then it's um, like, if we talk about big change in the carbon pricing, um, it has to be also kind of uh, with a way how we modernize the, the, the full um, industrial sector. Of course, when we look at the countries and also within Ukraine, and that's position of the Ministry of Environment, that the companies actually pay for the pollution. It doesn't mean they should get money back. But still, uh, they point out at the many examples from European countries, from Australia, from other countries, where actually the government helps and provides uh, a lot of money to the industry. Or if we take uh, steel companies in EUTS, which I used to get a lot of free allocations and like did not really pay the same price for carbon as uh, electricity sectors. So when we look at this in more details, there are actually many questions uh, to be answered and to be able to formulate the right approach for Ukraine, how to, how to, because when we hear from economists, carbon pricing is a solution, that's good. When we start to work and down with different sectors, it, it it's not so easy. Yeah, the, the whole world is testing out uh, things now, and um, yeah, uh, there, there is from EU side the carbon border adjustment mechanism proposal. Um, which uh, is, is also still quite uncertain perspective for, for many um, for how it will impact the industries. And yeah, and uh, uh, Markus Lippold also just wrote us that he has to, to leave. So I would give him also uh, opportunity to, to say a few uh, concluding words from his side uh, at this point. Um, and, and Irina, thank you for, for being with us. If you have to leave us already now, uh, yeah. Markus. Um. Yes, thank you very much. Maybe very briefly, uh, in terms of what um, the, I mean, what Anna has said, uh, what Ruven has said, we are working towards um, sort of reform in general. That is why I also highlighted that we're looking at the legislation, which is being drawn up in, in RADA and uh, whether it gets adopted or not, because we have seen in Ukraine that even if you uh, adopt the law, it doesn't mean that it quickly gets implemented and uh, it is effective. So that remains a challenge. Um, but we are, the support group for Ukraine and, and the commission at large is really working towards everything that uh, Ruben and Anna have, um, have said. So that's a, a holistic uh, package, if you will. But it takes time. Um, Ukraine has the challenge that uh, in many sectors, I would argue, there has been underinvestment. Um, so now where to put the scarce money is, uh, is one challenge. Um, on the other hand, uh, you could argue that since uh, a lot of the investment that needs now to be made uh, does not mean that you have a lot of assets which haven't been written off so that you take a big hit to your balance sheet is actually uh, an advantage. So you can you can now really look at how do you best uh, renew your, your economy, which will then also obviously play favorably with what you just uh, highlighted, Robert, uh, CVAM. Um, a lot of what um, Anna said in terms of what the citizens are actually uh, really concerned about 
is uh, environmental problems, if you will, quality of life aspects, which are much closer to home. So yes, uh, the climate, um, the, uh, the, the climate change debate, um, I think is there with the uh, younger generation, but since Ukraine is not close to the sea, um, and uh, there will likely not be droughts as much as there might be, for example, in Spain, people focus more on what is closer to their doorstep. But again, all these measures in terms of air quality, um, how transport contributes, um, all of those are being tackled and are part of the Green Deal. So for me, the, the challenge is how to spend the sort of limited money also including what comes from the IFIs and donors in the, uh, in the best uh, efficient way. Um, getting, getting agreement with the uh, Ukrainian uh, stakeholders there and uh, thus being able to, to finance a recovery that makes sense in terms of uh, not subsidizing uh, industries or assets which are on the way out, if you will, anyways, but uh, looking at uh, the right sort of uh, assets and R&D to make uh, industry in general more competitive uh, in Ukraine. Um, simultaneously have uh, citizens benefit from clean, cleaner water, better air, uh, and in that sense also square the circle in terms of having uh, or making CBAM less of an issue as it would otherwise be. Sounds very easy, it is, it is not. Irina said um, the devil's in the detail, um, but the focus is there. Uh, we just need to stay the course. I think that is the biggest challenge uh, in Ukraine, where it's often one step ahead, two back, um, if all stakeholders and interested parties continue looking at the uh, big prize for the mid and long term, then, then we'll get there. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Markus, uh, for this. And uh, yes, I guess you have to, to leave us now, uh, or you already left. Okay, thank you for being with us, Markus. I need to, sorry, apologies. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, then um, we have 20, 25 more minutes left, uh, and I would still uh, open the floor now for, for more questions from the audience. Um, uh, please use the, the raise hand function in Zoom, um, and then you can um, come in and uh, ask your, your question with your own voice, that would be most uh, comfortable uh, way of asking questions here, of contributing to the discussion, if you like. Um, uh, until there are questions coming up, um, I would like to, to come back to um, Uven and um, Anna on the, um, uh, with a more sector approach of, um, which are the sectors that uh, should have biggest priority um, and in terms of um, yeah, low hanging fruits, what, what can be achieved uh, very, very quickly. Um, having in mind, uh, oh no, I, I, won't, I won't elaborate from my side, but give you the floor. Uh, maybe first Anna. Um, right, thank you. Um, yeah, very briefly, I think uh, in general NDC um, mentions the most important sectors already, and uh, these are um, these are energy um, related ones, and that makes total sense for Ukraine to concentrate in the coming decade on um, energy supply and demand side, and and how to transform, how to actually make the energy transition possible. Uh, so the issue there is all the NDC shows that, yeah, this is the, the sector to cut the emissions. Um, yeah, the issues I already mentioned, there is no coal phase out date, although there are just some discussions now, but there is no clarity at all about what is the transition about, what we are transiting, like, you know, 
to to wear it at which date uh, and how um and another uh, thing i we just noticed and and i think that's an interesting observation that uh, um, during the Ukraine EU summit that was just happening, um, there was a new there was a news came out that the president uh, of Ukraine was mentioning uh, a new program that uh, that Ukraine has already as a plan on energy efficiency in buildings, and uh, that Ukraine needs uh, 300 billion grivna, if I'm not mistaken, to to finance this program. Um, and there is a big discussion now among, among everybody who works on energy efficiency. What is this program that he's talking about? What is the 300 billion? And uh, nobody ever saw it even. So while Marcus was uh, asking a very good question of how to spend a limited of money in the most efficient way, uh, I think it's a great question. On the Ukrainian side, uh, I think the question sounds absolutely different. It's like how to attract the money for something and we'll see then later on what exactly, you know? Um, so there is something that is called a program, but in fact, it probably doesn't exist. Uh, I think there is a mismatch and Ukraine has to prepare well, uh, it's kind of home task uh, and to make sure when it comes up with some ideas, they have to be really, really clear. Uh, the goals have to be clear, the energy transition pathway. And of course, there are so many issues around of how like uh, having everything working, but there is also a good example of the energy efficiency fund, which I think, uh, which could be um, kind of, the, the, this experience could be used to create something similar and, and also I think successful in the nearest future. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Before passing on to Ruven, there's one uh, question from Oleg Zavitsky. Uh, Please switch on your microphone, Oleg. And uh... yes, so uh, if uh, if I may uh, to continue this uh, uh, topic of energy efficiency, um, question to Anna uh, is: uh, Do you expect that uh, uh, the um, uh, current efforts of the energy community uh, would? Uh, um, help uh, and uh, Ukraine will finally implement the uh, energy efficiency uh, framework directive, uh, which is now uh, uh, is listed as uh, like a uh, uh, violation of U Ukraine uh, of the um, conditions of the energy community treaty. And there is a, a dispute settlement active against Ukraine uh, for uh, not implementing uh, this directive. Uh, do you expect that uh, this dispute uh, uh, settlement uh, mechanism will uh, somehow stimulate the government and legislators uh, to finally uh, adopt the decent legislation? Great. You announced you have a second question to Ruven. Uh maybe later so we don't uh, lose the focus oh, okay then uh anna first on on this Absolutely. and afterwards <laughs> yeah um thank you for the question oleg um i think the uh, the energy efficiency directive uh is uh, well we are almost there because the the draft law on energy efficiency that is supposed to implement the directive is just uh, coming up in the coming weeks yeah. normally um, at least it was announced it was supposed to come on the 5th of October uh, to be in the agenda for the parliament to be voted for uh, and, and passed uh, fully, but uh, because of the changes in the parliament that was postponed. Uh, I think it's, uh, it will not be an issue and, and, and the, energy, the law on energy efficiency, the draft law currently, uh, was uh, was a kind of, it's a, almost a piece of art because it has many, many pages and, and it, it almost... Um, transfers all, all, all of the most important things from the EU directive into Ukrainian legislation. Uh, I think at least the main uh, ideas um, and the EU commission also, EU support group, uh, they worked a lot with, with Ukrainian le legislators on that. So I think it's fine. Um, what one most important thing is that uh, it's not, it's first of all, of course, to make sure that the law actually is implemented uh, an issue for Ukraine. Uh, constant one, uh, because it's a very big one. So to make sure that actually uh, it, it comes uh, well as quickly as possible, it's implementation. 
And the second thing is that uh, the, the law will finally, once it's uh, passed, um, will allow to create more financial instruments uh, to support energy efficiency renovations and also uh, different ones, including energy efficiency obligation schemes that are already in place in Europe for many, uh, many years. Um, so hopefully that would also help to drive um, but then this directive would not solve everything. And as Ruven also was mentioning, uh, the poor, uh, poor regulation in the, in the energy sector, uh, if it stays the same, uh, any, you know, any new law would not, just would not help. Uh, so, so many kind of uh, puzzle, like a puzzle has to come together at some point uh, and there, have to be, there has to be a political will uh, for the change. Well, that is encouraging that we have a decent draft law in, in the RADA. I was not aware of it, and let's hope that it will be adopted. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. My question to Ruben was uh, on the uh, uh, other topic. Uh, it's uh, about uh, uh, oil and gas sector. Uh, did you cover uh, it in your research? Uh, I mean, uh, in terms of uh, methane emissions, uh, because now this becomes a very uh, uh, important topic internationally with this uh, new uh, initiative, uh, a Global Methane Pledge, and uh, the efforts to create the International uh, Methane Emissions Observatory. So uh, did you uh, have uh, any insight in, in what, what we, we have currently in terms of methane emissions from oil and gas infrastructure? Uh, thanks uh, for the question. Um, we, so we are following uh, the developments with the, the Global Methane Pledge and um, we did uh, have somewhat of a look into the supply sector as uh, as we call it so the 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 upstream kind of oil and gas but also coal um sectors and their emissions mainly methane emissions uh it's not really our focus of work so i can't uh unfortunately i don't think i can uh, tell you much more than than you probably already know um we our, our work is mainly focused actually on uh on energy transformation and uh, mainly electricity for now at least uh, um, but we we do see that there are substantial methane emissions in uh, spe specifically in uh, gas uh, transmission and um, we do think that there might be uh, coming back also to the question of, of uh, Robert on the low-hanging fruits there might be some low-hanging fruits uh, in in the supply sector with uh, with the gas transmission system where there's uh, like uh, leakages um, or some uh, what's it called like the uh, compressors uh, that are not working uh, properly uh, where uh, actually in, in, in some areas uh, some assessments have shown that it might actually be even without a carbon price or, or price on methane emissions, that there might it might be profitable to fix some of these issues, uh, but it's just kind of the um, a lack of uh, investments or maybe also a lack of understanding where exactly the problem is that uh, these issues are, are not not fixed yet um, or at least at least not improved so um, but we we would have to look more into detail in, into that sector to to kind of give uh, some idea of a policy proposal what uh, what the government could maybe do to incentivize uh, closing some of these leakages yeah so that's i think that's all i can i can say on on oil and gas unfortunately mm -hmm. um, thank you okay um i would like to come back once more to the the question of political will uh, uh, you anna just mentioned the um uh, the example of the energy efficiency uh law uh, but um marco said was talking about um, uh, other laws that uh, got stuck in the parliament. Um, Anna, what what would you uh, think? How, what's uh, what are the obstacles for?
for for this political will what's uh, what is uh, the, the background for the um difficult for the difficulty to to find enough political support for for these uh, uh, uh legislations like um um like um, emission reduction which is actually very positively uh, uh connoted in terms of um, reducing pollution uh, so what's what's the difficulty to to get the support from the political uh sphere for for this uh, laws um yeah yeah I, I would say that um first of all when the political change happened in 2000 um 2019 uh, definitely the kind of uh, all the, you know, the knowledge and the teams who work, for example, on energy efficiency changed, everything changed, um, the government, the, yeah, the, the, main, the main people uh, who were pushing, for example, for the energy efficiency fund, the, the, um, uh, and all the kind of uh, issues that are surrounding the energy efficiency changes in general and reforms. Uh, and um, there was just a lack of, um, People in uh, people in, in in the parliament and in the government, uh, we as civil society or also other experts who work in the sector could work with uh, in 2019. Now the knowledge kind of is slowly. I think it's already improving the situation after two years at least that the the, the parliament members also received uh, uh, lots of amazing messages from from not only from civil society but also from uh, you know the EU Commission and, and from everywhere saying you know this is an important topic you should keep working on it, it's not forgotten and so on. Um, so I think there was this, this gap that kind of formed suddenly uh, and uh, still, still in the parliament, for example, there are not many deputies who are not just, there's, there's some that want to work on, on, the, uh, on the topic, but they don't have enough knowledge. So they're not sure where to start and so on. Um, and, uh, and they are not, um, they don't actively kind of uh, advocate for, for uh, certain changes. Um, and of course, in general, when we talk about energy sector, the main, um, the main uh, limiting factor uh, or, or something that kind of makes us stuck in where we are is, um, well, the, we, we can call it the lobby of, of, uh, of indus industrial lobby, you know, uh, of different stakeholders who are also there in the conversation. Of course, it's not only about implementing the EU directives, but also about listening to everybody, trying to find a consensus and so on. And there is definitely a very big difference between what the Ministry of Environment uh, wants to do, what it's trying to do. Uh, and I think the NDC in this way, uh, it was supported by civil society because it was a, a, an important step, positive step ahead. But then meanwhile, there is a Ministry of Energy which keeps uh, in many ways supporting the old system, the old actors, uh, and uh, yeah, and it does, does not, that, that doesn't really help uh, big changes to happen. Of course, there is a progress in certain discussions, for example, on coal regions in transition, but that happens also in many ways, thanks to this uh, dialogue that already exists in the EU, thanks to the EU Green Deal, and just the necessity, you know, to, to be involved into this conversation. Um, but um, in terms of um, the value that the Ministry of Environment has in the government and the Ministry of Energy, the Ministry of Energy kind of wins <laughs> um, their, their uh, rhetoric and so on. Uh, and in the end, it translates into uh, a president who says, I will decrease uh, electricity price for the population. Uh, it's I suppose it's not supposed to happen in any European country in that way. But that's what what we have, unfortunately, uh, and that uh, that just happens year by year. And all, it was also the case uh, previously in the in the government. But still, you know, we always try to think that okay, something probably changed. It's for better. But then uh, this doesn't. Um, yeah, it's not all, uh, totally the case. Uh, so there are certain difficulties now, um, and uh, now with the new NDC to come back to what we are talking about with the new NDC. There is an ambition, um, the kind of how much resources we need, uh, approximate estimations are clear, but now, yeah, the, the main question is, how do we implement it? Um, and uh, for now, there is, I think there is a lot of ahead discussions, plans, uh, concrete action, and so on. 
so we are kind of now in this void uh, waiting for the uh, for the action. Yeah, there's uh, the bottleneck that uh, the government cannot uh, manage everything at the same time, and, and this is obvious that there's uh, there's a lot to do and a lot to coordinate. Uh, this is what uh, um, both Irina and Markus were, were talking about. I would like to come back once more to uh, to Ruven uh, with a question on uh, of um, how do you assess uh, the the uh, kind of effectiveness of this structure from the European side, from the EU side, um, because we see different institutions from the Commission, the um, European Energy Community. We have the uh, uh, the, the association agreements and, and uh, other institutions, um, the Eastern Partnership Initiative, um, and we have bilateral corporations um, on, uh, on decarbonization related topics, such as the, the German-Ukrainian Energy Partnership. Um, uh, do, do you see uh, uh, a problem in, with it, or is would you say uh, the the topic is just big enough to to accommodate all the different formats, and um, uh, and is the the new uh, uh, format that um, Irina and uh, Markus were reporting about the the um, new coordinating group or focus group um, is is uh, can this be an effective tool to to better coordinate the, the different um, tracks of the EU-Ukrainian cooperation. Um, thanks uh, for the question. And um, I think definitely it's always helpful to coordinate uh, action between different stakeholders. So it's kind of a no brainer. And I think the focus group in this regard can, uh, can do a lot of uh, important work in kind of bringing uh, together, maybe also uh, co coordinate and monitor what uh, if different member states are uh, having as initiatives, like you mentioned, the, the German-Ukrainian uh, energy partnership. So our, our project, Low Carbon Ukraine, is, uh, is uh, in this context of the German-Ukrainian energy partnership. Um, so uh, yeah, I don't know if I can uh, have a neutral, completely neutral answer to that question, but um, let's say um, I think it is important that if there are different um, groups of partners and, and groups of donors also when we talk about financial support, um, it is very important to coordinate uh, what everybody is working on, what, what are maybe also the different conditions for support, because in the end, uh, if you don't coordinate at all, uh, there might be this, this perverse effect of of uh, donor competition, basically, that so if uh, the EU says uh, we care a lot about uh, this and that issue and uh, we will support you and we want to support you, but only if you, um, I don't know, uh, increase the electricity tariff or uh, reform uh, the renewable support scheme or whatever, and then uh, the Ukrainian government thing has, for some reason or another, doesn't have the incentive to, to implement that uh, specific reform. They might just go to uh, the member state, individual individual member states, um, and bargain uh, and find uh, some partner that uh, doesn't uh, have this condition in their support. Uh, and that's not the idea here, right? So the uh, to have an effective uh, European climate diplomacy, um, you need to have first of all uh, kind of an understanding on the goals and, and an understanding of what are the key transformations that you want to support and the, the key reforms that you think um, should be uh, supported and also conditions attached to the support. Uh, and if you don't co coordinate this, uh, you will have these problems. So I think the, the focus group can play a, a, an important role in, in coordinating these issues. And um, I also think so in, in, in the uh, the paper that we've recently published that you mentioned at the beginning, uh, we propose actually to to kind of re rebundle all all these uh, all the support in what we call in the paper kind of a, a Paris partnership, so uh, that you have one um, yeah 
kind of hub where uh, you, Ukraine can go to and uh, I mean the, fo the, the focus group does uh, in in some in one way or another does do exactly that but uh, I think it would be still beneficial to to kind of rebrand it give it uh, maybe also think about increasing uh, the the financial commitment from the European side make uh, make a more strategic uh, outline on what are kind of conditions attached to this additional support and then really focus it in in one hub uh, if you call it Paris partnership or you call it something else uh, that doesn't really matter but that's the the main idea yeah okay thank you Uwe. um then uh, our time has come to an end um and there were i at least I haven't spotted any uh, any more questions from the audience. There would be a very last chance to do so right now. Uh, um, yeah. Otherwise, um, um, I would like to to close uh, this event now. Um, uh, I think. Yeah. So from from myself, I I learned. Uh, that there is more that we have this this new focus group on a high political level but i wasn't really aware of of the the details of how it works and i think this is a major step forward um and um yeah and we saw that we have a lot of um uh, uh actors uh, working constructively on on the topics uh, though uh there is of course a lot of work still um to do and um, uh, and and there's not always uh, a good and quick solution um, of how to do things, um, but at least there's uh, there's a lot of uh, yeah also positive and constructive energy um, into this in this process, and um, I think that uh, this is actually a, a good basis to continue this. Um, uh, work and communications work and clear and analytical work on on how to um, how to go forward on this path and um, yeah in in that sense um, I thank everyone for being with us this afternoon and in particular the our speakers and the, the those who remained Anna and um, Uven. Thank you for, for being with us and contributing to, to this discussion. And let me also thank the uh, two interpreters, um, Katerina and uh, Anastasia, uh, who uh, helped uh, the audience to understand, um, to follow the, this discussion. Thank you. Um, and last not least, also uh, the technical host uh, background team in the Heinrich Böll Foundation. Yeah, thank you. Have a good evening um, and uh, hope to see you soon again uh, in follow up discussions uh, like this one. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.